Hey everybody, this is uh, Nevin Gusak, your host of the Patriotic Populist. Today we have a very special guest. We have Charles Daniel, the Charles Daniels, excuse me, the head of American Workers First. Did I say that correctly? Yes, sir, you did. All right, excellent. And he is also a veteran union member of the Communication Workers of America. He is a fellow union brother. Herschel and I are both members of unions in our respective careers. Uh, Herschel is an electrician and I am a library manager. I am a member of one of the umbrella organizations of the AFL-CIO, the Government Supervisors Association, proud union member. Uh, and I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Daniels to today's show. How are you both doing, Herschel and Charles? Go ahead, Charles. I'm doing excellent. I appreciate y'all having me. Uh, Herschel and I have talked a, a bunch of times at this point. He's good people, and I'm happy to get an opportunity to, to meet and to talk with you, Nevin. So thanks for having me on. Oh, sure, sure. It's our pleasure. How are you doing, Herschel? Are you feeling a little cooler today? <laughs> no, it's still hotter than shit down here. I suffered just a, a mild little bit of heat exhaustion yesterday, so I've been having all kinds of fun. Well, I see you're drinking the Gatorade, so at least you're taking the proper precautions here to avoid overheating. I swear I probably drank a gallon of that shit since yesterday. Oh, yes, and your body was probably thanking you for it. I don't know. Who's telling me to get the hell inside? Yes, air conditioning rules, that's for sure. Air conditioning and a nice shower. Anyway, so we're going to be talking uh, with Charles for a little bit. We're going to be talking about some politics. We're going to be talking about quite a bit of his union activism and activities, uh, if you will, whatever you're comfortable with, of course. Um, so I want to start out with a question. Um, how did you become involved in union activism? We'll tackle that question first, followed up on if you want to disclose it, if you're comfortable. Also, did you experience a political evolution as well? Were you a Republican who all of a sudden became more pro-union and populist? So, you know, tell us a little bit about that. So as far as, as how I got into union activism, when I was 21 years old, uh, my son had just been born. I was a high school graduate and I was looking for a job and I just stumbled into a union job. And I thank God every day that I did, because now it's 20 plus years later, my son's in college, he's doing great. I've got a nice house, I've got a beautiful wife, I've got two other children. And so much of that has to do with the fact that I've had a stable union job over these years. And I used to take that for granted when I first started. And I was one of the guys that thought that the people that needed protection were the ones that were out there doing something wrong. And then I had an incident that happened where a manager accused me of doing something that I didn't do. They said I went to a place I wasn't supposed to when they're the ones that told me to go to there. They're the ones that sent me the facts that was there. I was able to show it to them, but still in the disciplinary meeting, they called me a liar, just straight to my face, called me a liar. But I had two union stewards there that had my back the whole time. They called him out. They took care of me. And I walked out of there and I said, holy shit, this is just it's bigger than just being a good worker. You can do the right thing and still end up on the wrong side of someone, because when it comes down to them or you, it's going to be you every single time. And after that day, I was a, a, a very active voice in the work group. And I strongly believe you don't you don't need to have any kind of leadership position to, to be in your garage, to be in your shop and speaking up when wrong things are happening, because companies will try to get away with things and they'll take advantage of situations and you need to stand up for your rights. People have fought and died for those rights. And it's up to us to continue to be that link in the chain because we are. Absolutely. No question in my mind about that. I've also on very uh, on occasion have also been on the other side too as well where i was accused uh this was years and years ago by really frankly a bad manager who thankfully is retired from the library system that i work at and uh, i was accused of all kinds of different things on mishandling something and i didn't receive the proper information prior the proper training and whatnot and this individual also wanted to set me against my supervisor so uh, really, it, it was a very ugly episode. And thankfully, he was also kind of pushed to retire, from what I understand. And, you, you know, the point is, is that also I was reading recently a study which shows that labor, there's a correlation between active labor union membership 
and the development of the traditional nuclear family. So I wanted to throw that out there, and I discuss that in my book, uh, Volume 2 of Turning the Page, My Evolution from Conservatism to Radical Civic Nationalism. So I wanted to also ask you, um, you mentioned before off air that the American Workers First has how many issues, five or six issues of concern. Can you talk about, list that and talk yeah. about that for a little bit? Absolutely. So being a, a, a labor activist, there are people across the spectrum when it comes to political beliefs, and I interact with all of them, and it's my responsibility to, to represent them in a lot of ways, right? We have a duty of fair representation. It's one of the best things about being a union member is those people, it's their job to represent you, to make sure that you're being protected. So when I'm talking to those folks, I'm always trying to find common ground because I believe there's a lot of forces in play that try to divide us, but I think we have more in common than we do the differences if we actually start talking to each other. And they use social issues, race issues, religious issues, and it's been happening since the dawn of time. But once you actually start thinking that, hey, if I'm a worker and workers succeed, I can put all this other stuff away. So every party should be pro-worker. That's the way I feel. Mm -hmm. So that's why I started American Workers First, because I felt like we were fighting about stuff that didn't didn't necessarily promote the benefit of all of us. There was no advancement there. So there's six core issues, right? Number one is in right to work. It doesn't work for workers. Right to work states you earn less, less benefits, and you're less safe on the job. And I mean, those are the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You can look up those statistics. It just doesn't make sense. The national call center legislation. I'm a firm believer that companies that are offshoring that work, that have people answering the phones in India, in China, in the Philippines, in Jamaica, they shouldn't be eligible for, for tax breaks, for tax incentives, right? So I believe there should be national call center legislation that promotes keeping those jobs in the United States. It kind of takes me to stop offshoring federal contracts. Every year, the company gives billions and billions of dollars to corporations and they're <laughs> companies like General Motors to build cars in China. They're paying Boeing to build planes in China. I, I'm sorry, General Motors to build cars in Mexico, uh, Boeing to build planes in China. Same with Lockheed Martin. And if companies want to run their business that way, so be it. But I don't think that we should be paying for it. I don't think it should come at the expense of American taxpayers. So that's number three. Number four, get rid of Citizens United. Mm -hmm. Companies are not people. Money is not speech. It's been one of the worst Supreme Court rulings for one of the most insidious ones because it's not blatantly obvious people don't see it but it's horrible and it's really tainted our democracy we need to get rid of it five living wages for all americans workers have fallen behind when it comes to what they should be earning um, if, if minimum wage had kept up with your productivity or with inflation you're making over 20 dollars an hour and that's trickle up money everyone past that would be making more as well so having folks fight against poor people is a good way to to keep everyone suppressed and then finally, fix the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. There's just broken pieces to it when it comes to territorial taxes. These corporations, when they have their offshore profits, they're able to filter it through the Netherlands or Ireland. And essentially, it's just legal money laundering. And some of those things, the corporate tax rate got lowered from 35 to 21 percent, but some offshore profits are actually half of that. So how can an American worker compete with someone who is being essentially set a lower bar in a foreign country to do the work. There's a reason why you can import something as heavy as steel from another country and still be competitive. It's because those workers over there are being exploited. And then also the tax system is broken to help those companies. We're, we're digging our own graves. So those are the six core issues of American Workers First. No, that sounds all excellent. This is stuff. The, those are issue positions that we would wholeheartedly support at the patriotic populist because we do support uh, we do oppose free trade, we oppose the tax code, really the concept of Reagan, Bush, Trump tax policies, which is all total trickle down uh, nonsense that has been long discredited. Uh, you know, we support uh, the ending of the H-1B visa program, or at least ending the abuses of the H-1B visa. B program that's implied in your call in the national call center legislation. Uh, so it's really refreshing to hear these voices such as yours on the show. So Herschel, what do you have for uh, Charles? What kind of questions? So do going, have? going back to the beginning of your statement, I have to say, I really agree with the point that you made about the culture wars. See, one of the friends of the show, a guy named Bob Gardner, he released an episode on the Appalachian Pop Populist podcast. I think it was the first episode. He called it, it was called Judicious Mixture. 
And it was basically going over how the coal barons in West Virginia used race politics to break the union movement and to slow down populism in the area. And, and if you look at it today, it's it's the same shit all over again. Um, Tucker Carlson, of all people that I would have never expected this from, it had to be him. He put out a study that was showing how around the time of Occupy Wall Street, there was a massive uptick in race related um, articles, uh, media segments, and all other kinds of things. Basically, is the news was nonstop talking about racism and injustice in the United States at the height of one of the most populous periods in the last century. You know, the Occupy movement really had steam. It wasn't nothing. So, again, I have to say I absolutely agree with you, and I hope the audience can pick up on what you're saying there. So the question I have for you is, so you are – a president, I'm not going to say you're local because I don't want to get that involved, but you are a president of a local CWA. Yes, I am. How did you go from two stewards defending you in the office to president of your local CWA? So after that, that scenario, I became a steward and I was happily a steward for the next goodness 15 years. And then in our local, the, the president moved on to the district. He went to staff and my chief steward said, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, told me, hey, I think you'd be good at this. And uh, I ran and I was fortunate enough to win. And I've been doing that for now the past, goodness, six years or so. And it's just been such a privilege to get to, to represent people. I, I love the fact that every single day I wake up and from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, I try to help people. I try to help workers. I try to help people that sometimes can't help themselves. And I tell, I tell folks all the time, I'm in the sleep business. All I do is do everything possible. But so when I lay down and go to sleep, I got a clear conscience. Mm. Sound good. So what would you say is the hardest part of your job as president? And then what would you say is the most rewarding part of your job? So the hardest part is definitely dealing with the fact that I, I can't fix some situations, right? Because I'm a fixer, right? I'm a guy. I'm a type A personality. If there's a problem in front of me, I want to fix it. But sometimes it's just not there. Sometimes contractually, legally, whatever the scenario is, I just can't fix it. And a lot of times I got to be the bad guy when it comes to members, right? Actually telling them this isn't going to work because the contract says this and this is how it's interpreted and this is how it's been implemented. And they didn't break your contractual rights. So you got a gripe, you don't have a grievance. So that's very challenging because folks, they want to get a certain answer. And when they don't get it, they're upset. So that's difficult because I'd like to be able to help everyone. But then the, the counterpoint to that, the most rewarding thing is really what goes along with it when I am able to, to help people and, and them just saying, hey, this was sort of a, a path in my life where there was a, a fork in the road where something was going to happen and you were able to fix it for me. And I know without a doubt that there's a handful of folks out there that still have jobs and are, are still able to support their families because of stuff that I, I've done. Well, that's, you know, and that gives hope to me because, you know, I, I do want to move up into the, the politics side of the IBEW one of these days. And it's always interesting to me because, yes, obviously the CWA and the IBEW have very different jobs. But at the end of the day, the union purpose is about the same. Your job is to make sure that your members are keeping the, the contract is being upholded by the members and the contractors and to make sure that everybody goes home at the end of the day. So it's good to hear that. It really is because it gives me a little hope about what to, or at least a little what to look forward to one of these days, I guess. Yeah. And I'd say to people that don't know about unions, that's really what it's about is having a contract, having a deal that's agreed upon by both sides where this is how our relationship is going to be governed at work. You actually have some rights because you look at these CEOs that are making millions and millions of dollars and every single one of them has a contract. They wouldn't work without a contract, but they expect you to. Mm -hmm. When you come together and you collectively bargain, that's where you actually get some leverage. If, if you don't have a seat at the table, then guess what? You're on the menu. Oh, yeah. Precisely. You know, that's, and this is what I tell people about it. Because, look, I, I've known a lot of guys, union and non-union workers, and I'm not going to sit here and say that non-union workers are bad workers or bad guys. Because, look, I sp I've only recently become part of a union. I joined nine months ago. I, all that other time was spent working on non-union crews around some of the best men that I've ever met in my life. But what I will say is that there is hardly anybody that is skilled enough on their own to make real demands to a boss. 
I mean, yeah, you might bargain for a little bit of a pay raise and a little bit better benefits, but the average worker, you know, his grievances and gripes, he's going to keep to himself because that's all he's got. Yes, and, and I'd say that a high tide lifts all ships as well. So if you have two two factories next to each other and one is union and one is not, that non-union factory has to compete with the union factory. And that's one of the ways that they've lifted wages. Over, oh, unions almost did too good of a job of, of this stuff because a lot of it was put into labor law and, and people just started to take these things for granted. They didn't, they didn't live in a time where you didn't have FMLA, where you, where, you, where you didn't have paid vacations, where weekends didn't exist, where there weren't overtime laws, child labor laws, when OSHA didn't exist. They didn't have that. So they just think that this is something that we've already had. And when you actually start studying and you see what folks like, you know, A. Philip Randolph did in the past, mm -hmm. wow, it gives you a new perspective and you actually appreciate things. So I think one of the things that Americans struggle with is a feeling of gratitude. And I have just a tremendous amount of gratitude and respect for what's been done before me. And the best way to avoid making a mistake in the future is to know what's happened in the past. So you should learn your history. That's why I'm a big fan of populism, because it's shown what exactly happened with that movement, how they how, how they really crushed it before. And you look at the Farmers Revolt, you look at the stuff in William James Bryant. I, there's, there's just a lot to unpack there. And you can use that, like Nevin, you were talking earlier about some of the, the social stuff that, that's out there. And a, a, a lot of what we have now and people go, oh, this shouldn't be here. It's there for a reason. It's because we tried it a different way and it didn't work. I mean, the income inequality we have right now, it's never been this bad. And, and in 1929, we saw what happens when it gets too far. The whole system collapses and you have tremendous suffering. And when that happened, Herbert Hoover, he was the president and he was he was not a, a, a labor friendly president. He, he, he came out of the financial sector. He was a businessman and he couldn't fix that problem because he couldn't even identify what was wrong there. And what was wrong is the gap between the haves and the have nots got so wide that the have nots could no longer afford the products that they were making. So Correct. when that happens, the only recourse the company has is that they're losing profits is to start laying people off. But that's the snowball rolling down the hill. You lay people off. Now less people can buy it. And it's just this self-fulfilling prophecy where there's no bottom to it. So they create programs. And now we know why some of these recessions start and we could head them off beforehand. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there that will use their positions to try to benefit themselves. And they're trying to take a bigger piece of the cake. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of guardrails in place to, to keep the ultra wealthy from exploiting workers. It still doesn't exist. I mean, shit, I was looking at something the other day about the, the CEO of uh, Palantar Technologies, a cat named Alexander Karp, and he topped the list last year of CEOs, made $1.1 billion. Half of his revenue from the company comes from federal contracts. Our government is funding income inequality. It's absurd. Well, you know, and part of the problem is, is that our government, since at least uh, President Jimmy Carter is under the sway of free market fundamentalism, or let's just call it market fundamentalism or neoliberalism. And the ironic thing, I have a little phrase that uh, I shared with, um, with uh, Herschel, that Reaganism paves the way for acceptance of communism and other domestic radical ideologies. You see from the national security point of view, and my area of interest is domestic and uh, national security. And more and more people, when you look at why people are joining Democratic Socialists of America, when you look at Matt Heimbach, some of the now defunct uh, traditionalist workers' parties and other neo-fascist groups, all collectivist totalitarian ideologies, why people are joining, even communists that Herschel and I know personally, why they rejoin communist parties and people joining the Communist Party USA. I do the studying and I've written about this. A lot of it is, is, a, is a symptom of the failure of the current globalist, reactionary, anti-labor, highly financialized form of corporate capitalism. And this is one of the things where I have some disagreements with some good anti-communists and others agree with me halfway or partially. And the problem really is the system. And there are solutions to this. Franklin Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, you look at Otto von Bismarck in Germany, it's not enough to pass laws and smash domestic left-wing radicalism and investigate them and expose them. A large part of it is outflanking them. 
And the way to defeat, I say this to our conservative friends, is use the examples of history and think strategically, outflank them, accept their arguments that are based on merit and reality, and then outflank them. And you mentioned, both of you, you were, Charles, you were talking about right to work. And one of the things I think Herschel can back me up on this is Oklahoma and Florida. Florida was the first right to work state. And Florida, it's, certain counties, including Broward and Miami-Dade, by right to work state standards have some strong, semi-strong unions. Um, but companies, corporations, including these allegedly woke progressive companies like Amazon, as we saw in the Bessemer Union Drive, yeah. they nope. will employ rather reactionary anti-labor practices, of course, of launching disinformation campaigns to try and squelch union act activist drives, union building drives. And how does your organization, have you personally encountered that? And what are some of the union's plans to really smash those efforts by reactionary employers? And I say reactionary because they want new Gilded Age. And this show has no quarrel with capitalism and private enterprise. But we feel that it needs to adopt a different ethic, partially through changes in our dominant culture as well as regulatory climate. So what are we, what are we going to do to stop that? Because it's very powerful, and they play the game of divide and conquer. Yes, and and that's a it's a great question. And Michigan went right to work. Goodness, around a decade ago, we we had a governor that came in that he was a Republican, and he was he was an outsider. He was a businessman, and he said pretty much from the jump that right to work wasn't on his radar. It wasn't important to him. But then when they got in, they they pushed it through. They attached it to an appropriations bill, which means we can't bring it up for a vote. It, it's it we're stuck with it, and we've been right to work since then. Our our union really hasn't lost that many members because of it, because they understand the the benefit of being union but mm -hmm. these companies they're playing the long game they understand that the people that get why unions are important will stick around but it is so challenging to organize in a right to work state and you saw that down in alabama with the amazon folks because let's let's look at this right let's say you got 75 percent of the people down there that say i want a union i want i want to join a union i want i want this organization drive to work but those 25 percent can say i don't want a union but if a union forms, you still have to represent me. I'm going to opt out. I don't have to pay dues. You still have a duty of fair representation. They still get all the contractual gains that you have. Everything everything still applies to them. They just can't vote on a contract, show up at general membership meetings. But they don't care about that shit anyway. So now you got 25% of the people that aren't going to do it. Now you have that 75%. And, and if 25 more percent look at that and say, well, I'm not going to pay dues for someone else to, to freeload. So screw this. I'm not going to do it either. And all of a sudden, more people start falling out. And unfortunately, when it comes to, to labor law, there's decent labor law out there, but there's no real penalties imposed on corporations that break those laws. I guarantee you Amazon broke the law when it came to what they could and could not do legally in Alabama. But there's no recourse. You can press a board charge. You can do something like that. But there's no penalties associated with it. None whatsoever. Zero. That's why things like the PRO Act are so important, because that actually puts some teeth in labor laws where they can be fined up to $50,000 per incident. So tell me, I mean, tell me, Nevin, if if, if the, the laws for, for speeding, where if a cop saw you and pulled you over, all he could do is tell you to knock it off, who's fucking out there following the laws? People are going to be driving 100 miles per hour down the street. Everyone's going to suffer. You have to have penalties for when companies break the law. Well, I have one thing even better for you. And I mentioned this in my book, uh, in volume two of Turning the Page, my uh, evolution from conservatism to radical civic nationalism. I got one thing better for you. You get companies get a tax deduction for that, for for retaining lawyers to fight unionizing drives and firing workers who then under labor law can sue the corporations. But when the corporations uh, hire lawyers to defend themselves, they get a tax deduction. Apparently there's an internal term that employers use. They call it their license to hunt or their hunting license, as you may know. Uh, so yeah, this has to be 
there has to be much more stiffer penalties than thank you, frankly fifty thousand dollars because the large companies can handle that and eat that um you know i mean personally i speak for myself and not necessarily the patriotic populace you can choose not to comment but if a large corporation engages that behavior especially on a consistent basis let's do three strikes you're out and then you lose your corporate charter and your company is put in receivership and you have other more patriotic and more socially minded investors will take it over because they're i don't want to say behavior modification because of the authoritarian uh sound of that terminology but look you punish doctors for malpractice you punish lawyers for malpractice and this show has a lot of sympathy for small and medium-sized firms they don't have the same resources as larger corporations these large corporations which own the political system which has sold out this country to tyrannies and everything else abroad and enemies of the united states they need to get they need to get more than slaps on the wrist or admonishments they need to understand that the firm hand of justice will be imposed on them when they violate the rules like that and it's in their interest to do so in the long term you know on this show we want to ultimately preserve capitalism and a large measure of free government and Karl Marx always said he said in the communist manifesto that the bourgeoisie can degree essentially the greed of the bourgeoisie because a lot of this is based on greed the greed of the bourgeoisie will lead to its undoing it contains its own seeds of self-destruction yeah. and this is where ultimately unions save capitalism when they're led by proper and incompetent and com proper and competent leaders such as yourself and others and that's how i ideologically have become to accept unions more because i was in a similar position oh why do i need a union i'm a good worker I never got disciplined but then as i had life experience and also as i did a lot of reading i mean let's take a look at right to work and i'll see the few see the show to herschel in a moment but i want to educate the people about right to work it is a fraud google vance muse m-u-s-e first name Vance he is one of the progenitors of right to work other than his anti-communism and support for tariffs everything else about that gentleman is loathsome he was corrupt he's based in Texas a publicist and business person and he used right to work as a tool to oppress black southern Americans essentially and eject them from the labor force to prevent union drives in the south that were occurring in the 1940s and the local reactionary globalist anti-labor planting plantation capitalists essentially in the south were having a hissy fit about those union organizing drives and they wanted to prevent it and they use racism the guy was a dyed in the wool jew hater and hated black people and people of color and that's where right to work started look it up vance muse then you have also by the early 60s you had the u.s chamber of commerce and the national association of manufacturers which by the way conservatives supported trade with socialist tyrannies even back then it was an issue that divided them just wanted to throw that out there right-wing hypocrisy they were forming the national right to work committee the same flag waving corporations that were like we love america but hey we want to trade more with the soviet union and china and we're for more free trade the lar the more wealthier members of the u.s chamber of commerce by the way and the national association of manufacturers they supported it they supported the creation and composed much of the manpower and brains behind the national right to work committee so really right to work is not pro-labor it is a con it started out as a concerted effort to attack labor and to use culture war issues to divide labor which ultimately 
divides our sense of nationalism and solidarity in this country. And we are for a positive non-xenophobic nationalism or patriotism, if you want to call it as such. So I wanted to add that there to kind of educate the viewers out there because this is very important information. And Herschel, I wanted to, since I'm going on my stump speech here, Herschel, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, you know, cede the field to you and ask some more follow-up questions of Charles. So one of the things I, I was I was wanting to wait because I knew that you and both you you were having great points there both of you. Um, when y'all were talking about the fifty thousand dollar fines to Amazon or to that would be under the act, another one of the things I was thinking about, not directly related to the workforce, is the company that manufactured uh, OxyContin. I can't remember their name. Um, Purdue. Evan, Farm. Purdue. Yeah, it was like when Purdue. Well, let's see. Purdue got what was it a hundred million dollar fine? or 75 it was some minuscule fine for the their role in the opioid epidemic i mean you're, you're talking about a multi-billion dollar company they could eat that shit on a friday without even having to cook their books yeah. i mean that that's what we're up against right now these corporations I, I don't think the the average person understands just how much money these corporations are worth i, I mean because the fact of the matter is, is that most people would be lucky to make a hundred thousand dollars in a year. A very small percentage of the population will make over a million dollars a year, but the a billion dollars is such a large amount of money that most people cannot wrap their minds around it. And, and that's what I, I want to go on about. Like, if we're talking about serious legislation that is going to slow down the corporate overreach and the destruction of the working class, we're going to have to put some shit in there with some real teeth. And that's why I tend to side more with Nevin against the or at least taking the pro act a little bit farther is, is that we have to hold these business owners genuinely accountable for their actions and one of the things that i've thought about often come up in conversation was the the uh, chicken processing plant and it was in alabama too i believe um was it hunts huntsville uh, that chicken plant that got raided under the trump administration oh that was coke foods in mississippi i believe in mississippi yeah so, you know, when Coke Foods got busted and several hundred people got deported over that, the owner of the company or basically anybody that had any real managerial role, nothing happened to them. A wanton violation of labor laws in the United States with no re repercussions at all. It's, it's that mentality that is killing us. And I don't know what we can do to fix it. We're three guys talking on a computer. But the people in the United States have to understand that if we're going to stem the tide of this destruction that we're seeing, we're going to have to start demanding real action against these companies. So my mini stump speech over. I have a question for you, Daniels. Yes, sir. So we've talked a little bit about your role in coming up in the union and how you've got to where you are. But what would you say to the next generation, my generation of guys, the guys that are just cutting their teeth in the union? Um. I would say that we're standing on the shoulders of the people that came before us and that you're a product of your time and the fight that's in front of you. It's just as important as, as any other fight. You don't get to choose the fight that you're in, but you do get to choose how you react to when it happens. Like Hattie Canty, she was the president of the Culinary Union uh, in, in Las Vegas, and she oversaw the longest strike in American history, six and a half years. That was in the 90s. She didn't sign up for it. It just happened. You look at Mae Chen in New York with the garment workers that in the 80s, you had 20,000 of them taking to the streets of New York. She didn't sign up for that, but she did it. I mentioned A. Philip Randolph for 12 years. The Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters tried to just get recognized as a union and they were getting beat in the streets. There was horrible things that were happening. The Pullman Company was hiring goons to beat them up. But they held the line because they knew that workers needed a voice. They needed representation. So things are different now, but they're also still very much the same. I don't people think people understand, truly understand how bad it is. You should be getting paid more for your labor. There has been a overwhelming sea of an organization fighting against workers being properly compensated. And when you start looking at that union uh, density levels and income inequality, you see the break in it. You see the split. And when you start looking at CEO compensation over the past 10 years, where it's gone up a thousand percent and workers haven't even kept pace and the minimum wage is set at 725 for the past 11 years, there's a problem. Nevin, you mentioned Amazon, right? 
that company is a monopoly. Google is a monopoly. Apple is a monopoly. You mentioned Teddy Roosevelt. He used the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is over 100 years old, to break up monopolies that were problematic for the United States citizens. We don't use those anymore. These companies have lobbied their way into getting away with corporate murder. They're, 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 they're the foxes in the hen house. I don't know what else we need to tell people other than all these lobbyists out there. They're stealing from you. They're stealing from the United States. And there's only so far that you can slide on barbed wire. And eventually it's going to crash. And when it does, these folks are going to float away in their golden parachutes and workers are going to suffer. Let's head it off before that happens. And the way you do that, Herschel, is by educating, by talking about it, telling people what's going on. And we have to stop preaching it, folks, and, and start actually having conversations with people. Because a lot of times it's just I want to talk about what I want to talk about and I don't care what your thoughts are. And, and there's a lot of talking down to people that happens. And that's a problem. Mm. Well, you know, and it's it, it's the point like you made earlier about um, FDR, the New Deal. And, and now I find myself a lot of times conflicted about the New Deal because, yes, I absolutely saved the United States, but it also wasn't completely effective. I think that you get up in these camps where it's one or the other, you know, either the new deal, you take the Republican route, the new deal was completely worthless, extended the great depression and ruined everything forever. Or some of the more partisan hacks will be like the new deal, greatest thing ever passed ever God's gift to humanity. But one of the often not talked about points, because it's usually raw economic data that gets discussed. The, the hope that the new deal gave people is what saved this country. When people believe that tomorrow can be better than today, that is why we managed to make it through without some totalitarian revolution destroying the country. And that's what I, I try to remind people today is, that, look, people are hopeless of their situation right now. Like you talked about, wages have stagnated. Home ownership is becoming a, a harder and harder for your average person to achieve every year. Car, new car ownership is, you know, that's another one of the things that most people don't talk about. All of these statistical indicators are showing that the middle and lower class are just taking it on the chin year after year after year. And these people are, they're eventually going to snap. And, and that's what scares me and Nevin to death so much is because that we see the rise in radicalism around the country and everybody is radicalized and don't claim it's one side or the other. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's one new commie for every new fascist in this country or QAnon or whatever. These, these people are waking up to the reality that for the last well, at least like 60 years, really, their country has been progressively stolen from them. Their dreams have been stolen from them. Everything that they were taught growing up, that if you work hard, dedicate yourself, live a clean life, go to college or join a trade, that your life is going to be good, that you will leave something good to your kids. But how often have we seen nowadays that that's just not the case anymore? How many people are one bad car accident from a life of poverty or a cancer diagnosis or whatever? These are the things that have to be talked about. And this is why I hate identity politics so much is because every time that identity politics makes its way into a conversation, it just kills all the real dialogue that could happen. Well, yeah, I wanted to add something real quickly, a little, not slogan or whatnot. Yeah. Look, the abuse of corporate capitalism doesn't discriminate against whether you're a gay worker, a Christian worker, a black worker, a white worker, or a Hispanic worker. To a globally minded corporate capitalist, they don't care, you're just a disposable commodity. And I'm not saying that out of turn, that's what they say. And the corporate theories, shareholder value primacy. They don't care, gay, straight, Christian, white, Jewish, whatever. So I just wanted to add that in there, Herschel. Well, money talks. And at the end of the day, that's what this entire conversation is about, is the fact that money just fucking talks louder than we do. These corporations have gotten away with murder because they can pay the right people off. And that's why, that, that to me, now I don't know about y'all, but that to me is what worries me the most about all of this that we're trying to do, is because this is not the first upswelling of populism in the United States. You know, the United States has experienced several great periods of populism or at least more working class focused politics, I would say. And what worries me so much about this is no matter how big a fucking movement that we build, that it's just going to die on the Senate floor. You know what I mean? You know, because 
shit. I mean, these people have deep ass pockets, way deeper than I could even imagine most of the time. And I don't know. So, Charles, what do you think? I think I think eventually it's going to be so bad that people are going to have to take notice. It's going to actually start impacting people. And I don't think either. I don't. I don't believe in extremes being the right course of action. If you're super right or super left, I think you're missing the point. And if you look at leaders that we've had, you, you mentioned FDR, right? And some people are going to say that he's this giant liberal uh, president that was a socialist and yada yada yada. There was a lot of people pushing at that point for the United States to go communist. They were dealing yeah. with the Great Depression, and there was a lot of people thinking, we need to change all this. FDR was a capitalist. Yes, he, he held was. Yeah. Yeah, you he look just, at the criticisms that Huey Long leveled against him. I mean, everything that a lot of the more progressive, I'm not trying to interrupt, this is just a point to go off. A lot of the more progressive-minded people in the day criticized FDR for not going far enough with the New Deal. Well, yeah, the Communist Party USA, up until its popular front, opportunistic popular front, with elements of the Roosevelt administration, called Social Security the greatest fraud against the Mer American working class. They claimed Roosevelt FDR was a fascist in league with big business. And when you look at his conversations with officials, he said, look, I got to protect this country against the crazies of the Hitler supporters and the communists. And the Nazis and their allies in the United States thought that the New Deal was uh, capitalism, that they were more revolutionary than the New Deal. When you look at Father Coughlin's criticisms, he was felt that the New Deal was too capitalistic and too much enthralled the bankers and too protective of the banks. You know, you, you, the Nazi press at the same time, the same thing. So when you really look, one of FDR's achievements, like Otto von Bismarck, they ch checked the advances of collectivist totalitarian tyrannies, whether fascist or communist. And this is something that large parts of the American right don't understand. And again, one of the thing, one of the main reasons why I departed the American right as Reaganism is because they are anti-communist, as our friend Kenny says, Herschel, they are anti-communist by convenience. They all of us come anti-socialists when it affects their profit margins. But yet they have no problem to run to Cuba and Venezuela and China and Putin's Russia and Iran to try and lift the embargoes, which are already violated anyways because of U.S. policy. I mean, there's no real blockade on these countries. They, corporations trade with Iran. Corporations trade with Venezuela, Cuba, and I can bore you both with details inside and out for 40 years on how that was accomplished. And guess what? Nothing was done. You had during World War II, I, a gentleman who I knew who was a friend of James Angleton, the uh, counterintelligence head of the CIA until he was pushed out. There was actually evidence which was accumulated which showed that during and after World War II, through the Bank of International Settlements, you had American banks and companies trading with the Axis powers, Nazi Germany, and Stalin's Soviet Union afterwards. But yet, the government couldn't do anything because, number one, they were afraid if this information came out, there would be strikes, there would be riots, there would be instability. And the fact that even then, the banks and the industrialists had so much sway. So what I would think, Herschel, both of you are asking how this system can change. There has to be a new culture of leadership, a new elite groomed in this country. There has to be, as Charles said, massive education to really uh, understand the role and value of labor and capital investors that will, that they exist as an organic coal in a free economy. And then also, we have to also really have a hard discussion on uh, the role of property rights of the private sector oligarchs. They have to be made to understood there are obligations that they have to adhere to for the greater good of the country, for our national security and our sense of national solidarity. Because at the end, their behavior is going to destroy the system. It's going to destroy their rights to own property. It's going to usher in fascist or communist tyranny. 
And people are not going to sit around and read history books like the three of us on, you know, how horrible it is in a communist country or the Third Reich, which is another model of collectivism or heterodox socialism. They're not going to read about that because they're freaking hungry and they want to sure. provide for their families. Yeah. And, that, you know, Franklin Roosevelt said dictatorships thrive on hunger. It did in Nazi Germany, in Bolshevik Russia, land, peace and bread is what Lenin talked about. But yet, of course, they take power and then it's too late. And then there's even more hunger. Herschel and I don't want to get to that point. Yeah. And the in the right wing in this country, the alleged right wing, Rush Limbaugh and Mark Levin and Ben Spiro. Um, yeah, we can't stand them. But we're not fans of theirs on this show. Oh, uh, all just... they talk about is identity politics and they say that they're job creators and this and that and blah, 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 blah. And they don't talk about these issues. They think Ronald Reagan was this economic miracle. Well, let me tell you, I grew up in the 1980s. You had industries closing in New York as a result of Reagan's support for Makila Doris, which was unfortunately a bipartisan thing. Makila Doris are those transplant factories in Mexico elsewhere where companies under liberalization of tariff laws started by John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, where they can go and t take advantage of cheap labor. And the bottom line is, is that the country is being hollowed out through dumping by Japan and other countries. Even the Soviet Union, Reagan, allowed dumping of steel into the American market. You know, it's in my books. I talk about that. You know, the great anti-communist. But now you understand, Charles, my disillusionment with the right and why we need a Teddy Roosevelt, Otto von Bismarck, FDR style populism that combines the best leaders, the most moral leaders, the most patriotic and empathetic leaders who are steeped in history, who act as fathers for our country. That's ultimately what's going to save this country. So now I made my stump speech and be sure to vote <laughs> for me for Senate. <laughs> yeah, and it's, and it's hard because you take someone like Teddy Roosevelt, you know, McKinley dies, Roosevelt comes in, he does a good job, country starts to succeed, he wins that next election. It gets, I think, 1908, he says, I'm not going to run again, everything's good, he leaves, Taft comes in, Taft's his guy, he thinks everything's going to be great. Holy shit, it isn't great. He comes back and says, no, I'm going to I'm going to be the president again, I'm going to run again. And the the system, the, there, was, there were primaries in every state at that point, so he couldn't win the nomination. That's where he forms the Bull Moose Party, the Progressive Party, to break away because he had to, because the establishment, even someone like Teddy Roosevelt, who we look back on and say, what a great president, they were trying to stop him because it was going to take power from them. All these people care about is maintaining their power. That's all that they care about. So it's all just placating people, telling folks what they want to hear, wiling them up. They, they appeal to the most base nature. And unfortunately, sometimes the government, it's got to be the bad guy and tell people, you got to take your medicine, you got to eat your, you know, your vegetables. There's things that you have to do, but no one wants to be the bad guy anymore. Yeah. Well, you've been corrupted by, quote unquote, libertarian propaganda, which is really what neoliberalism is. And we've lost the American conservative movement and even the neoliberal market fundamentalist wing of the Democratic Party, they've really lost uh, focus on, yes, you need, the population needs to have rights, but there also has to be responsibility. I mean, uh, the famous uh, conservative philosopher, Russell Kirk, called it ordered liberty. And really, that's what we need in this country. He was a traditionalist conservative leader, as are in elected, as both of you know, hated libertarians and with not so popular with conservative incorporated, by the way, Mr. Kirk. So that's really, I think we need a new, I think in this country, when I, unfortunately, both of you don't have to comment, but unfortunately, I think it's going to take a major catastrophe. And I think there are enough good people out there within average people, like three of us. Average people can be extraordinary at the same time, extraordinary men and women. And, you know, maybe you both will come to the fore and, you know, take leadership roles in your community. Funny things happen in times of crisis. Sometimes the best people come out uh, and leaders are born of that. And let me tell you, it's not going to come for the most part from the Fortune 500. They're going to be going to their bunkers that they spent several million dollars with in missile silos. And for me, I mean, 
you know, let them rot in those missile bunkers while the real patriots take over. Um, yeah, just go ahead and weld the door shut. Yeah, we'll weld the door shut. That'll be your job, Herschel. <laughs> okay, you'll leave the team there. Um, you know, well, and then they won't fuck up policy anymore for this country. You know, let them get welled up and let them be museums of the freak political freaks that they are. So the bottom line is, is that um, it's going to take a catastrophe. But I got good news for you. I think in the end, I am hopeful and positive that good men and women will come to the fore and take leadership and hopefully will lead this country in a new path and hopefully with a new political ethic that takes the best of our founding fathers and combines it with reality based policy. What works for the public interest? That's my thought. But it's going to take a very uh, it's going to take a very difficult situations to get us from point A to point Z. Well, if you look on the bright side of it, that's what the Great Depression did for us. I mean, sure, the, the Great Depression was an absolutely horrible event where that that scarred the United States in many ways, but was also the catalyst for so much of what we have today. It's like Charles was talking about. So many of these things that we take for granted, like FMLA, the overtime laws. Mm. I mean, the, the Fair Labor and Standards Act was passed as a result of the, the Great Depression that set a bedrock for workers' rights for the future. I mean, sure, it wasn't perfect, but so many things positive come out of such a catastrophic event. So I am hopeful. And don't worry, guys, when I cross the Pontiac uh, or the Potomac, I'll make sure to give you really fancy horses to ride on with me. Don't worry. I'll make sure good, pretty horses. And, and Herschel, I think it's important to point out the Fair Labor Standards Act, some of the stuff they're trying to do with minimum wage laws and overtime and the 40 hour work week. They and child labor laws, even they had tried to pass that stuff for years and years. Mm -hmm. It took decades to get some of that stuff passed. They were looking at a 30 hour work week at one point, and the corporations pushed back against that. So, again, we just take for granted that it's been like this, but someone fought to get it, and we just need to continue fighting. And, Nevin, to your point, you look at Reagan and the, the, the comment of the, the scariest words you can hear are, I'm, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Yeah. But the government can help people. We've seen it historically. We just have to demand better out of our elected representatives. And I don't care who they are. Fucking vote them out if they're bad. Yeah. And Elizabeth Warren, the senator from Massachusetts, uh, she had a very good phrase or good treatment of the role of government. It's not the question is not whether a government is small or limited government versus, quote, big government. It's who controls the government, what kind of men and women, the caliber of who they are, the morality, the patriotism, you know, the sense of the old aristocracy is uh, our previous guest, uh, my previous guest on the show from less than an hour ago, J.R. Nyquist, geopolitical analyst, put it, that aristocratic sense in the old sense, you could be lower class, middle class or upper class, but you have those ethics that are animating your decision-making policy truly in the public interest. And it's that's really what it comes down to, who controls the government. We are an oligarchy with democratic trappings, as I call it, or a yeah. plutocracy. For sure. And it is not sustainable for in a free society. Those types of systems collapse. And this is what keeps me up day and night, politically speaking, is the collapse of the United States of America. And there are powers that are willing, more than willing, to take our place, and not for the better for the global scene, uh, I might add. Um, but what are your, and I want you to expand on your thoughts. You can get 10 minutes if you want, because Herschel and I have been hogging the microphone, um, <laughs> especially me, um, you know, and it, saying a lot of good stuff, of course, Herschel. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. What are your thoughts about the future of American labor? Do, are you, do you see things improving in this country in the long run? I mean, what about the thoughts of my predictions and analysis and the analysis provided by Herschel? Um, it's a simple answer. 
Yes, I see improvement on the horizon. When you look at polls, labor organizations, unions, they're polling better than they have in the past 50 years because people are starting to understand. To, to use an analogy, the whole thing, you, you, you have boiling water and you throw a frog in there and it jumps right out, right? But if you put the frog in cool water and you start warming it up, it'll just sit in there and cook. We're the frog in the pot. And we've been cooked over the past however many years. So we just think that this is normal. We don't understand that we're, we're, we're getting eaten alive at this point. And I think that these young kids coming up are looking at how they're being treated and, and that they're not earning what they think that they should. And that college tuitions have been skyrocketing and higher education has just turned into a money making scam. And these kids are saying, why? Why are we letting a bunch of old people run our country into the ground. To your point, it is a plutocracy. And you have people that fund Democrats, conservatives, libertarians, green parties, all with the same pool of money because they want to keep us fighting with each other. And they're able to get stuff through like Citizens United, where you can't even follow the money anymore to figure out who's paying off who. It's it's a broken system and it's getting to the point where you can't hold it together with duct tape anymore. And I think these kids are seeing the force for the trees. And I think that they're ready for a different take. And I think unions speak to their understanding that the union message being that an injury to one is an injury to all and that you should have more. You're right. And and unions have, are getting much more traction poll wise. The biggest challenge is smashing through the brick wall of the propagandists of plutocracy. And so many people, to be honest, they're caught up and the news media is terrible i don't watch cnn fox news or msnbc at all they all suck let's be honest <laughs> they don't cover the real issues and i think this is where independent media like us here and grassroots or real grassroots organizations not astroturf organizations real grassroots organizations such as yours charles will help break the break ground and it's going to be hopefully a process of attrition where people eventually will take militant action to achieve a better united states of america uh so my hope is that through education is certainly going to help the biggest challenge is smashing through the wall of plutocratic oligarchy and the propagandists we have to stop in my opinion i hate identity politics you know, so many people are caught up with Caitlyn Jenner and and transgenderism and the Kardashians and, you know, you know, oh, my God, the you know, the gays and oh, my God, the Christians and oh, my God, Trump is an evil fascist. And meanwhile, they ignore the depredations of Reagan and Clinton and the destruction of the American economy. And they think, oh, it's all Trump's fault. And we get Trump out of office. Everything is going to be fantastic in this country. No. The problem is more fundamental and more structural. And independent media like this, like us here, is going to educate people and give them another point of view. Because CNN, Fox, and MSNBC, sorry guys, you're garbage. They're businesses. I mean, that's what yeah. they are. Absolutely. And the funny thing is, is they don't really hate Trump because the head of CBS, if you remember back in what, 2017 said, oh, you know, we might not agree with Trump, but Trump is the biggest, is the best thing ever because we we're making so much money off of him. So even these woke anti-Trump people, it's like, really, what's your story? What's your story, bros here? Come on. I mean, I think we can all agree to hate shit libs for just a minute. I mean, I really hate shit libs, but I, I would offer at least one bit of, of, of hopefulness for the audience. Our last guest, Luis Miguel, he talked a little bit about getting involved in your local politics. And one of the things that most people don't understand, most of your local political outlets, like your county's Republican office, your Democrats county office, are staffed with ancient dinosaurs. Mm. Most of these people are in their 60s, their 70s. They're retired. They're, they are doing this because they now have the time to do this. But they love young people. Oh, maybe not love young people for their ideas, but they love them for having a token young person in their organization to help <laughs> you. But getting involved in that, like, look, go get four or five of your political buddies and go join the local Republican county office and try to make a change in there. <coughs> I mean, I'm not never going to say this is easy, but this is the way that you start 
politics from the bottom up. One of the things we neglected, I got to interject this real quick. Uh, Charles here and his organization, American Workers First, are the first official group to join our coalition, the coalition that we built to help, you know, shape American politics. Yeah, I think I cannot thank the man enough for that. But one of the things that we try to point out is, is that we are not a party. We're not going to hold political offices for like, we're not going to have patriotic populist elections. No, our po purpose is to get people, populist minded individuals involved in politics. So I don't care if you join your local Republican office because you live in an 85% Republican district. I don't care if you join your Democratic office because you're in San Francisco. It's not my problem. All I care about is what you believe in. And if you are a labor oriented person that believes in helping the working class, get involved in your local politics and see if you can make a change. Because until you do, you can't, nothing is going to change without people putting their you know, ass on the line and doing something. You're here. Mm -hmm. Did you both have any closing comments uh, or uh, any other any any other points you guys want to add, Herschel and especially Charles? No, I think I'm good, Charles. I've, I've taken up enough of your time. <laughs> I appreciate what y'all are doing, and I and I love having the opportunity to to talk with like minded folks about just putting workers first, prioritizing them, because I, I truly believe that having a solid job, well, then, then you actually can start planning for the future. You, you can have a home, you can build a family, but it's all based around the security of having a job. Um, so thank you. Yeah, and You're thank welcome. you so, so much, uh, Charles, for joining us. Thank you so much for uh, joining our coalition too as well. I hope we can have future interviews with you we are always welcome uh on our show you've been a great guest oh, um would you like to come on future shows especially about current labor issues that come across our path hit me up anytime brother oh awesome awesome and conservatives out there remember charles brought up a really good point unions are necessary for the promotion of conservative values like building families and also national security. Remember, AFL-CIO under George Meany, amongst other union leaders, opposed communism at every turn. He is, in my opinion, a patriotic populist hero. So I wanted to close that point, especially with a plug to conservatives out there, because <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna ham look. I'm gonna hammer that bitch home until <laughs> I am red, white, and blue in the face. <laughs> of America. I mean, I, I don't play with stuff like that. So anyways, I wanted to thank you both. Herschel, great co-host as always. And enjoy the rest of your weekend, your union organizer uh, granted weekends. And <laughs> enjoy your work week. God bless you both. And stay tuned for our next episode of the Patriotic Populist. Thanks, guys.